Hello, and welcome to The Other Side, a program that gives you a glimpse of information that is not readily made available to all of us, information that tends to be obscured by our culture for one reason or another. Today we are fortunate to be able to visit with author and historian William Bloom, who has written several books about the devastating impact of U.S. foreign policy on people all over the world. Mr. Bloom was working in the State Department in the 1960s, but U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War raised his awareness of the many lives that were being destroyed in the name of peace, freedom, and democracy. Since then, he has spent his time pursuing the truth about U.S. foreign policy and educating others about that sobering truth. Please join us as Mr. Bloom shares his insights about U.S. foreign policy and its consequences on the rest of the world. Mr. Bloom, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. My history teachers never inspired me to look at the world the way your writings have. And it's a great honor to be able to present your knowledge and your passion for truth today to our viewers. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. It's, it's very unlikely in, in my mind to, to, to be here. I mean, when I think of where I've come from. The first thing I'd like to ask you about is about rogue state, which I understand was inspired by the bombings in Yugoslavia. Yeah, and we were told back in 1989 that the 78-day bombing of Yugoslavia was being done as an act of humanitarianism. And I was thus inspired to sit down and write this book, which in effect is a mini encyclopedia about the many types of unhumanitarian uh, policies the U.S. has pursued all over the world um, in the past 60 years. Mm -hmm. And I have chapters on, on each of the types of this unhumanitarianism, including the bombings and the overthrow of governments and the torture and so on. Uh, and this occurred during the Clinton administration, so it's clear right. it's not uh, party specific. No, no, the book is not, and, and neither is our U.S. foreign policy. Um, almost all of the horrible things done by the Bush people today, you can find uh, in the past. Um, the Bush people stand out more for their arrogance than for their um, new policies. They, they are very open and above board ab about their desire to take over the world. They, they are proud of it. And they write position papers saying very clearly that their ambition is to dominate the world and even outer space. So uh, in the past, uh, other of our leaders have been more coy about this. And uh, that's the one, one main difference between the Bush people and, and the past leaders. Bill, could you just tell us a little bit about um, the scorecard of U.S. foreign policy since World War II? Well, we have attempted to overthrow uh, more than 50 governments. We have succeeded about 30, 35 times. We, in the process, we have caused the death, directly or indirectly, of a few million people. I can't be more exact than that. It's very, it depends on how you define the U.S. responsibility. It's very complicated. But a few million people have lost their lives as a result of these overthrows and, in, and, and invasions and bombings. We've also uh, uh, attempted to assassinate about 50 foreign leaders. That's a, that's a big scorecard. Yeah. yeah. Um, in April of 2000 in Venezuela, the U.S. supported a coup to remove Hugo Chavez, the democratically elected president. Could you tell us what happened there? Yeah, before the coup, uh, took place, the leading members of the coup team met with, with American officials both in, in Venezuela and in Washington. And this was not a coincidence. Uh, I was asked at the time whether I thought that the U.S. government was involved in that coup and, I, and how would I know that. And I said I know that for the same reason that I know that the sun will rise tomorrow morning. That's what it's always done, and there's no reason to assume that tomorrow will be any different. And in such circumstances, with, given a leader like Chavez, and given the U.S., there's, n there's no doubt what, what has been the past experience. 
Such people are the targets of overthrow by Washington again and again and again, and there was no reason to assume any, any difference in, the, in this occasion. How do you think the counter coup su succeeded? Oh, that was an amazing thing, what happened. Um, the people of Venezuela en masse um, rose up and, and stormed the government offices and um, demanded that Chavez be released from, from custody. And, uh, then, and then this inspired some of the military people to join their forces. And once that happened, then the, the coup was, was doomed to failure. Mm -hmm. And it lasted only two days. Do you think that the United States is still continuing to undermine Chavez? Oh, of course. They've been trying ever since, even. They, they have, um, they backed financially the recall referendum against him. I think it was in, in 2004, was it? Um, they, they financed that referendum, but that was defeated by the people of Venezuela. They've been subverting his rule uh, via certain U.S. agencies, which are always used in such cases, like the National Endowment for Democracy, or NED. Mm -hmm. They're used to subvert foreign governments, or to subvert uh, movements which attempt to overthrow a government which, which the U.S. actually favors. Democracy is not their goal at all. That's part of their name, but that's just a game. Uh, that's NED. Uh, they're all over the place. They've used AID, the Agency of International Development, also in, in, in Venezuela. The IMF, the International Mon Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization, how are they used? Well, they're used to put pressure on governments which uh, don't want to play ball with Washington's um, goals, uh, and the World Bank as well. Washington has so many tools, it's amazing that anybody is able to resist them. Uh, Cuba is remarkable. It's, it's um, f fought being overthrown for 47 years now, mm -hmm. and they've succeeded. And uh, Chavez has, has done it so far for about six years. Um, but the tools available to Washington, uh, besides the, these financial organizations, there's of course the, the military, and there's the CIA, which can subvert the media. Well, well in Venezuela, that is not even needed. The, the media in Venezuela is very much in the opposition. They are owned by the upper classes, uh, uh, the former ruling class people, and they, they are unmitigated in their attacks upon Chavez. It's very ironic. People here in the States, like in Congress, if they want to they attack Chavez, they'll say he's suppressed the press, that there's not a free media in Venezuela, and yet the media in Venezuela is much freer than here. Much. I mean, you have opposition daily newspapers. In the U.S., there's not a single daily newspaper in opposition to the government. And I mean consistently and, uh, and strongly in opposition to our foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So it's very ironic that our congressmen keep calling Chavez uh, someone who's against uh, a free press. Mm -hmm. we, we have this notion in our country that we have a free press. Um, how can we get people to understand that it's not free? I think people are, are getting uh, a sense of that more and more as time goes by. I mean, from what I read and all my numerous emails, people attack our press even more than I do. The problem with our press, or our media, are errors of omission much more than errors of commission, which means that it's not that they tell out and out lies. They seldom do that. So, I mean, I can use what, what they do say, which is pretty factual. Their faults lie in what they don't tell you. They're errors of omission. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, when I use what I find in the daily media in the U.S. with what I find in alternative sources, uh, which is, has been left out of the daily press here, then I can put the two together and get a nice cohesive whole. I find one of the things that I admired so much in your writing is your footnoting, um, where you don't just make a pronouncement, you actually have a source that people can go to if they don't quite believe you, and, and uh, I think that's very yeah. useful because a lot of what you're saying is, is so foreign to our own 
country. Yeah. And it's hard, it's hard to believe if you don't, yes. if you don't see it, uh, that it came from a place which one trusts, quote unquote, like the right. Washington Post, for example. Uh, and m many of my footnotes sources are from the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, CBS, NBC, and so on. Right. In fact, I made it a point to do that. If I had a choice between quoting the same information from the Washington Post or from some alternative publication, I would choose the Washington Post because I want to impress upon my readers that I'm not, I'm not just making it up and I'm, it's coming from some place they've been taught to believe in. Where would you rank the U.S. in terms of a free press? Well, it's certainly better than most of the third world countries, uh, but it's not as good as you find in many parts of Europe. Like in the U.K., for example, in London, the Guardian and the Independent consistently, almost every day, have, have stories of, of great importance concerning U.S. foreign policy which don't appear in the American media. And you know, that's on a regular basis. And I'm always surprised when I see these stories and, and I see the, the absence of them in the, in the Times or the Post or, or the LA Times. Uh, that's, that's in England. I'm not sure so much about other places because of the foreign language mm -hmm. uh, problem, but I was just comparing it to England. Um, even in, in Canada, you also find many, many stories about US foreign policy which don't appear here in, in the American media. Mm -hmm. So I'd say we're behind the other English-speaking countries. So if someone wanted to become more educated about U.S. foreign policy, reading your books would be a, a good start, I'm sure. But beyond that, what do you feel like they should be doing? Well, on, on the, if they have access to the Internet, mm -hmm. they can read the, the World Press. Uh, or even better, they can go to a number of Internet alternative uh, websites, um, progressive websites like ZNet and Counterpunch and uh, Dissident Voice and Online Journal, a whole bunch of others, uh, which carry every, every few days, they carry a whole um, list of new articles written by people on the left about world affairs, which I think will be very surprising to many readers because they cover all kinds of things or many aspects of things which are not covered very well in, in the main media. Mm -hmm. And that's easy to access. For what end would you say that the corporations who own the media and the government, uh, what, end, what is their end purpose? The, the end purpose is to maximize profits. Uh, whatever they do has the same end, to maximize or optimize profits. And uh, the, and, and, uh, of the corporation itself and of the position of the, the individual executives of those corporations. And they proceed from the assumption that the American people much prefer to hear positive or happy news about their country. And that's what they want to give them. Their success as corporations depends on their audience, on the size of their audience, and they have to appeal to the most people possible. So they have to, in effect, dumb down some of the message uh, to avoid offending uh, too many people, to, to, to maintain a higher level of audience viewership. And so they avoid telling the worst. They, they avoid uh, making too many people unhappy. People don't want to hear many of these things which I write about. Uh, even so, our government abroad is doing so many horrible things, it's impossible for the media to avoid uh, all of them. I mean, you would have to just not mention Iraq at all if you wanted to just avoid any, any bad news. Um, but still, in general, they try to put a positive spin on things and maintain the fiction, and this is a very important fiction, that the U.S. government, no matter what it does abroad, it means well. The main obstacle I have to face in attempting to convince people of something which is new to them is this deeply embedded belief that their government, no matter what horrors that they, they carry out abroad, the government has noble intentions. They do mean well. Their intentions are very mm -hmm. honorable. And as long as a person believes that, then no matter what you tell them, 
they're going to put you, what you tell them into that context, and that, that context will change the whole angle of, and the whole meaning of the news report. And as long as you cling to the belief that it's based on good intentions, you will always be confused. You will be, always be forced into trying to reconcile this idea of them meaning well with the horrors that they are, the same people are doing. You know, it's, it causes confusion in people's minds until finally it, it, a bell rings. They don't mean well, and that's the beginning of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Iraq, and I would like to, to cover that. Um, starting back with the first Gulf War, what really happened back in the late 80s and early 90s that was threatening to cut the U.S. defense budget? Yeah, one of the reasons we wanted that war, uh, like the invasion of Panama a year and a half before, uh, the Cold War had ended, um, and there was this feeling, uh, now we can live at peace with the world, and, and this was a dangerous thought in, for the Pentagon, because they don't get money when people have such ideas. They, they needed w war, they needed enemies, they needed to show how important our uh, military was. The invasion of Panama took place just a, f a, a few weeks after the, the Berlin Wall came down. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they didn't even wait. There's no subtlety in there. They put on a, a light show to impress the Congress and, and the American people that, yes, there still is a great need for our military and, and, and for the budget. You can't cut the budget. We're dealing with these terrible people. That was in 89. And then in, in, in beginning in, in 1990, uh, Saddam Hussein became the enemy, and uh, we, we invaded, and we bombed them day and night for 40 days. Was our defense budget saved by attacking Iraq? Well, it's gone up and up and up since then. Uh, the, the Cold, you know, we, we have been promised a peace dividend. When the Cold War ended, the, the money now being spent on, on the military would be used for peaceful purposes. So what happened? We, we, we never got that dividend, not, not for one minute. Mm -hmm. In fact, when the Cold War ended, the U.S. foreign policy did not change at all. Isn't that amazing? It is. That tells you something, doesn't it? It tells you yeah. maybe if you want to be suspicious, you might say the whole thing was a fraud. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a fraud. There was never any such thing as the international communist conspiracy. That was a phony thing from day one. And now what do we have to replace the... Uh, communist conspiracy. Well, it always has to be an enemy, mm -hmm. and now it's terrorism. And if it's not Saddam Hussein, then it's Osama bin Laden, or it was this fellow Azar Kawi, or somebody. Mm -hmm. we, we have to have enemies. What about Iran? What do you think uh, is on the horizon here with Iran? Yeah, I don't know if the if if the U.S. will invade them, and I, I think they want to, but they may not be as free to do so as they were with Iraq. I think what they want to do is bomb Iraq, uh, Iran. They want to bomb anything they suspect is involved in the process of building a nuclear bomb. If and when they do this, they will say they were very careful to minimize the loss of life, but they will kill thousands of people, and then uh, they will still not be sure whether they've taken out all the nuclear targets, because it's mainly underground. So they may have to keep bombing for a while to, just to make sure they've gotten all the targets, you know. And the, the, the loss of life will add up and, and the suffering will add up. Iran will be filled with depleted uranium, or DU, which is not played up enough in the media. Iraq, after the first Gulf War and after this war, has is the air and the soil and, and the blood and the genes of people are so contaminated with depleted uranium, uh, which causes all kinds of horrors in, in, the, in the adults and, and, and in their offspring. And it's a, caused great horrors for the American servicemen from the first Gulf War, where it was very common to explode shells which were full of, of DU. And as a result, you have all these fine particles of DU floating in the air, being breathed in by people, and they will radiate forever. And this is one aspect of our interventions and our bombings which is not given en enough uh, coverage. Bill, the name of one of your books is Killing Hope. 
To what are you referring when you use that term? And could you tell us briefly what that book covers? That book uh, has a subtitle, uh, U.S. Military and CIA Intervention Since World War II. And it's a country by country and year by year uh, um, recounting of the U.S. interventions all over the world. The title refers to what I see as the crushing of hope uh, in the form of various revolutions and, and movements. Because the targets of these interventions by the U.S. have been governments which were uh, progressive and movements which threatened to take power against some uh, oppressive government. And these are the governments and the movements the U.S. interventions have, have, have suppressed and overthrown. And I think that the hope which was carried or promised by these governments uh, was lost as a result, and that's why I call it killing hope. If our goal was to spread democracy, it seems very unlikely we would want to be killing hope in these countries that are progressive. So how would you really describe U.S. foreign policy? To think that the U.S. foreign policy is in any way an attempt to spread democracy is very hard to swallow because as I show in great detail, and, and other people have as well, for the past 60 years, the U.S. government has supported one brutal right-wing dictatorship after another all over the world. Uh, in Chile, in Zaire, many, many cases, we have overthrown governments w which were democratic and, ins and installed a, di a dictator. And, and then we have kept that dictator in power. When he was threatened by his own people, we, we have supported him and kept him in power. So we have been acting against democracy for decades and decades. And so to hear any American leader speak of a, a campaign to install democracy in the world is, is, is almost laughable, except that it's very sad also. It's, it's, it's so absurd. Our purpose has not been at all concerned with any kind of democracy. It's been concerned with maintaining a government that supported us or suppressing a movement which threatened such a government. That's the end purpose. And going a bit further down, the beneficiaries are American corporations. The corporations actually are the ones that need the expansion into other countries. And so are you saying we're protecting their, their rights? We're opening up these countries to them as we did in Iraq in the past few years. We are protecting their investments in those countries. We overthrew the government of Guatemala in the 1950s because they had uh, nationalized the holdings of uh, United Fruit Company, and we overthrew the government. And then the new government quickly gave back all the holdings of, of the corporation uh, to it. Um, that was a very open and shut case of the intervention being to benefit an American corporation. In one way or another, this happens all over the world and has been happening for, for decades and decades. You did mention in one of your books client states. And what, what do you mean by a client state and what does it take to be a client state of the United States? Client state is any government uh, which doesn't have the means uh, to withstand the, the pressures from Washington. They have no choice but to succumb to the threats and the bribes uh, to, to follow policies which benefit American corporations. The degree to which they are a client state varies. Some, are, some have been complete clients, some have been semi-clients or, or what have you. It's not a scientific term, but that's what it means in general. If we were to define imperialism as a practice of one country extending its control over the territory, political system, or economic life of another country, would you say that the U.S. fits the description of an imperialistic power? I would, um, and it's, it's a, a work in progress. What's taking place in Iraq is a clear example of imperialism. It's to impose our will upon them. The, the, gov the government that we set up, the, the occupation government, uh, under Paul Bremer 
instituted a set of rules making life very easy for American corporations. This was made part of the law, and it's still part of the law. The, the new constitution, I think, says that these, these laws can't be changed. Bremer's laws themselves said they can't be changed except un, under some very hard to achieve circumstances. I forget the details, mm -hmm. but these laws are in effect in Iraq, and they guarantee that U.S. corporations can, can do whatever they want. They, they can privatize whatever they want. They will be free from government regulation. They are free from being sued. They are free from prosecution. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all in black and white in, in, this, in these laws put down by the American occupation forces. It's very clear cut. The words American empire have become relatively acceptable on our political scene. And I know they weren't uh, not too many years ago. But it appears what makes it acceptable is the thought that our empire is benign. And the Marshall Plan is quite often quoted as an example of our benevolence. I was wondering if you could discuss the Marshall Plan a little bit. When I ask somebody to give me an example which indicates that the U.S. government's foreign policy does mean well, the Marshall Plan is almost always w w the first thing they mention, often the only thing they mention. Mm -hmm. And I just recently, in, in my newsletter, uh, did a long study of that, uh, showing how it was not uh, so um, benign or, or even or beneficial. You must keep in mind, first of all, that this took place in 1948 to 1952, the height of the Cold War. There was no way to avoid the Marshall Plan being part and parcel of the Cold War. It was a tool of, of U.S. foreign policy in the Cold War. And the main purpose was to keep communists from power in Western Europe, and they succeeded in that. Money from the Marshall Plan was siphoned off to help defeat the, the communist parties in their elections in Italy and France. In both places, the communist party was very powerful, and they had a very large following, and they, they could easily have come to power legally that way. But the U.S. used numerous covert actions to thwart the uh, plan of these parties in France and Italy, and that was financed to a large extent by the Marshall Plan. The main beneficiaries of the Marshall Plan funds were American corporations. Often the money did not go to anyone in need in, in Europe. It was kept in the hands of the corporations. Mm -hmm. So it sounds as if, if we want to um, follow U.S. foreign policy, we should see what American corporations are doing. Well, you know the old Latin expression, qui bono, who benefits? It takes a bit of doing, it takes a bit of experience mm -hmm. to follow these lines carefully, and you have to know where to look and what to look for, uh, but the, the information is always there. One can find an awful lot. If one knows, if one is, starts out with being skeptical, you first have to be skeptical. Mm -hmm. You have to know some of the past history. If you're skeptical and you know some of the past, you know what to look for and, and how to know it when you find it. And it's, it's there. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a bunch of work. Mm -hmm. Do you think we as Americans have a firm grasp of what democracy is? Well, I don't know if, if my definition is the be all and end all. Uh, but in the 60s, it was very common to use this definition. Uh, democracy was having influence over the decisions which affect your life. Um, that's a non-legalistic way of putting it. But it's very simple, though. Those people out there are making decisions which affect my life on a daily basis sometimes, and in important ways. And what influence do I have over those decisions? That's what it comes down to. Just voting for a certain congressman may sound nice in theory, but in practice, uh, is that exerting influence over what he or his colleagues in Congress do? They are usually much more beholden to the people who, I was going to say bribe, but I won't be unfair, I'll just say who give them yeah. contributions. Uh, they, they have much more say. I mean, do I have as much say as Halliburton or Bechtel? It's hard to speak of this being a democracy when there's such an imbalance in the amount of uh, influence individuals have uh, compared to, to the corporations. Do you see 
um, a model that might work in the United States? Because it, it appears that we don't really have a democracy. Um, well, the first thing to do is take money out of the elections. Money in, in the election just poisons the whole process. Uh, and it's not, it's not easy, it's, and it's easy to say that, but uh, how exactly that would work has been discussed for years now, and I'm not sure whether a good, a good solution has been found yet. But if people would all agree that money has to be removed from the, from the process of choosing our people in Congress, if we all agree on that, then we can make progress on it. Some people, I think, just equate democracy with free elections. But if you do that, where do civil liberties and food and shelter and education and jobs and health care fit into the picture of democracy? Yeah. You have to affect the way people live. If one looks at the quality of life in Iraq, it's totally horrible. And you can't say, well, they had an election. Imagine if it was the Cold War and Hungary announced that it was holding an election under Soviet occupation, our media would have a field day laughing at that. Here, here, they're holding a, a free election under, under communist occupation, ha, ha, ha. But it's just as absurd uh, to, to think of uh, a free election being held under a U.S. occupation in Iraq. Do you think that Americans realize that as a nation we are better at preparing for wars on other continents than we are at preparing, say, for evacuating our citizens in a hurricane? Well, certainly we spend much more money on our wars. And uh, I don't think yeah, the, the government cared much for the people of New Orleans. And certainly because so many of them were black would play a role in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't imagine that if the same disaster had taken place in Beverly Hills, that you, you would have such a a laughable response. Certainly our response was much less than we could have made. Uh, we, we go all out to, to invade a country, spending hundreds of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Given our record of habitual military adventure since World War II and the fact that Congress has never declared war in that time, does Congress have any say at all in U.S. foreign policy? Well, it certainly could, uh, and at times it has some some say, but not much. For many, many, many years, they, they, the power of the White House has increased again and again, uh, and the power of Congress has gone down. Uh, and uh, under Bush, I think that they think that he, the way he shows this power more than anything else are his signing letters. When he when he signs a new law, he adds a memo saying, in effect, that that his administration is not bound by the, by the terms of that law. He's done this about 80 times since he's been in power. And this is really uh, is an amazing phenomenon that the president can just say openly, in effect, that I know this is the law that was passed by Congress, but I'm saying that because of the powers vested in me by the Constitution, I can avoid following the terms of this new law. And this just negates Congress. It makes a farce of the whole process. Mm -hmm. They vote on something which has very specific terms. And he says, I will follow those terms when it suits my wishes. And when it doesn't, I will not follow them. You mentioned that um, you know, our foreign policy is, is much more blatant now uh, with the, the current administration. Um, so you would. I would gather from that that people around the world are starting to really see us more for what we're doing and you know, with a lot less um, support for the United States. Do you see any kind of uh, blowback from this, any kind of repercussions from this? From the loss of a following around the world? Yes. Yeah, that's a very encouraging thing. I think uh, even... Uh, even our officials uh, uh, lately have attempted to deal with that. They, they have mentioned these polls. The polls would show a great lack of support of our foreign policies. in all over Europe, all over the third world, it's just remarkable. I mean, some countries, the, the positive vote for the U.S. policies is between 5 and 10 percent. Uh, and that's having an effect upon at least the, the public face of our leaders. 
when people ask me, what can we do, I don't really have any great solution except to continue doing what, what we're doing, and that is to educate as many people as we can. It doesn't sound like anything great to tell people, mm -hmm. uh, but I said, well, what is the alternative? We can't have a, an armed revolution. That, that would not succeed at all. We would all be shot dead within the first hour. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can only advocate to continue what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Bill, we really appreciate the time that you've spent with us. I hope that people will learn from this interview that there's a side of the United States that perhaps they should be more interested in exploring. I'd like to mention your website, www.killinghope.org, so that people can follow up on your writings and your books are available from your website as well as bookstores. I would like to ask you also if you would um, mention the um, two laws of politics that came out of Watergate. Oh, I'm in the habit of using these to close out my speeches. Uh, the first law of politics which came out of Watergate was uh, no matter how paranoid you are, uh, what the government is actually doing is worse than you imagine. And the second law of Watergate is don't believe anything until it's been officially denied. <laughs> and both laws are still on the books, right? Yes, they both are still on the books. <laughs> Bill, thank you so much for being with us today. You're very welcome. Mr. Bloom's website is www.killinghope.org. The website is named after the title of one of his books, Killing Hope, U.S. Military and CIA Intervention Since World War II. That web page gives details about the book and provides links to web pages for other books and essays that he has written. If you are new to Mr. Bloom's writings, we recommend that you begin with the book Rogue State, A Guide to the World's Only Superpower. You can learn an enormous amount just by reading the introduction and selected chapters right there online. Any of the books can be ordered directly from the website. For commentary on current events, Read Mr. Bloom's monthly essays online, or if you prefer, subscribe free of charge to have the new essays emailed to you each month as they appear. We hope you have enjoyed the show. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.